Bill Chandler, welcome to Place Focus. Thank you very much, pleasure. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank you. It's a beautiful uh, Melbourne sunny day, pretty standard weather, I, pretty I imagine. Pretty standard, yes, yeah, you've got it. <laughs> don't, be don't believe the negative publicity. Bill, tell us a little bit about this place that we're sitting in now. Well, it's an interesting space, this one, because uh, <clears throat> I suppose most of the spaces that I have memories of are because of particular experiences. And after living um, in London for a few years, I think it was in 1974, um, I was involved in the first Planning Institute um, Congress, um, which was organised in this place, and that was the first event in this hotel. Uh, I think it was called The Regent in those days. Um, and it's a space where I think it's kept its age pretty well. 1974 was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I think I've aged worse than the, the, than the space. So uh, it's a space I keep returning to every now and then, not least of all because of the experience of organising a conference here. So you were uh, president, I think, of the Victorian... Yeah, that was before that, yeah. um, in the uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s, I was the Victorian president. Yeah. So what was your background? You, you, you refer to on the internet as an urban designer, an architect, a strategic planner and a project manager. What, what do you normally call yourself? Well. Uh, um, very Melbourne, but I usually call myself a Collingwood supporter first, and that usually kills everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, my first training was as an architect, um, but I was always, always interested in something wider than just individual buildings. Um, and I was also interested in um, publishing. I didn't know it at the time, but as a 13-year-old, I edited a school newspaper, and that sort of continued on as an interest. And out of that really, I suppose, came the idea that if you're keen on ideas about how cities work, how places work, then you really do have to um, market it, I suppose, and therefore publishing is part of that, that marketing exercise. Um, but then my whole career has um, been constant slipping sideways. When I was 11, I was going to be a cabinet maker. My brain was better than my hands. I still like working in wood. Um, but uh, it's always uh, not quite good enough um, and then progressed to architecture, then architecture seemed to me to be a bit too tight so I moved into, into planning um, and then into a lot of project management work um, which was really integrated planning um, and out of that came the transport connection too. Um, so, uh, Do you call yourself an urban designer? Yes, yeah. I don't have a formal urban design uh, uh, qualification, ironically, but since really, um, I had the advantage of working with the Loder and Bailey group, which was one of the early interdisciplinary groups. And therefore, I don't think there were really urban designers in those days. This is the mid, uh, from the mid 70s. Um, if anything, people would have perhaps been called civic designers. Um, but urban design then evolved um, and then probably from the early 80s I started to think of myself more as an urban designer but in a very broad sense urban design in my definition is twofold it's how places function not just the aesthetics of how they look I've never been particularly interested in just the narrow definition of, of urban design Stefanos Polizordis, the, the American architect and planner, one of the new urbanist um, movement founders, talks suggests that planners need to think like architects and architects need, need to think like planners. Do you, do you agree with that? I don't think there's any question about that, but I'd widen it. The new uh, operators of the trams in Melbourne, their slogan is to all of their staff, think like a passenger. And I suppose for urban designers, uh, my slogan would be, uh, in that vein, um, think like an end user, think like the people who will use the places that you design and that you manage. Do we do, we do enough post-occupancy evaluation of, no. of urban design projects, do you no. think? We, and it's pretty natural, including myself, we're, we're all pretty frightened to look back <laughs> <laughs> um, because while we get pleasure out of things that we've done well, it's always a bit painful to look at things that you've managed to screw up or know that it could have been better um, and I've certainly got a number of examples in my career of where uh, um, I look around and say yes I wished I'd known that uh, what I know now then um, and uh, but it's never too late you know and um, Melbourne Docklands is one of those examples I know 
where things could have been done better and some of them are being redone and I don't have a problem with that. I think that's uh, good to be able to look back. If it's working, keep it going. If it's not working, do something about it. Well, there's a, there's a robustness to cities too though, isn't there? That, that change is natural and change is yep. inevitable and that we need to embrace that and, and keep looking onwards, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I think it's that evolution um, just this morning I was involved in a discussion about so-called uh, precinct structure plans but trying to get across that message that they are not two-dimensional drawings set in concrete. All they are is a bit of a framework to help you better manage the evolution of things as they occur. And there's somehow I think built into the pl partly in, in, in the name but in the planning profession and it's to do with as much as anything with statutory controls, um, which I don't call planning at all, it's a, it's a statutory tool. Um, that upsets some of my colleagues, but I can't help that. Uh, and if where the feeling is that you've got to get it right, and I think there's that inbuilt training which says, do it once and get it right. But I think that is to misunderstand what cities are about. Um, you do it the best you can from what you know, but then the city's going to change around you, regardless of whether you've got it right at the time. A lot of people too talk about the complexities of cities and, and it's almost impossible to have the right answer. You, you, there's almost a multitude of right answers. It's about selecting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I don't really look for right answers other than in the very short term sense. You don't want to get it wrong on day one. Um, but having said that, um, cities are complex. Uh, they're not necessarily complicated. We deal in complexity, and hence my focus, I guess, on end users to try and think through who is going to use this place, and then to get involved with a whole range of professions, and sometimes non-professions. Some of the, the people uh, in the early 80s I became, um, started to get very actively involved with a number of artists, um, and one or two of those who are very good friends of mine now know more about cities and how they function um, than, um, you know, before. Bill, we, we were just interrupted by security, wondering no, what just we were doing. Relate. I went to um, Euro Lille and was looking at the contrast between the new um, Rem Kulhaus um, work and the, uh, the old town of Lille itself. And in fact, I've got some amazing video of the difference of a town which is not privatised, like the old town, um, and the Euro Lille, which is heavily uh, um, uh, securitized. <laughs> My French is not very good. I had to go through five different people <laughs> speaking very good English to say, I'm from Australia, I just need some, you know, it's an amazing shopping centre. But while I was waiting to watch security beat up these little guys who were trying to, to deliver their little cans of yogurt five minutes after the critical time of 10 o'clock in the morning, and there were people being punched, and, but I was standing outside their privatisation line, so they weren't prepared to come and take my video from me. But it's an interesting comment on um, modern privatised spaces um, and the sort of city of where you can just walk around without being approached by, by security. If, if we were literally five metres yep. behind you, they, said they, that, they wouldn't have any right I to... like the idea that security here, if someone comes in and wants to punch you in the nose or me in the nose, yep. then you want some security around. Um, but it's more the attitude, and I found the Euro, Euro little exercise uh, a very interesting one. <laughs> it wasn't anywhere near as pleasant as this. <laughs> Bill, what's your favourite place in Melbourne? Well, I guess there's a number of them. By the time you get to my age, if you've only got one favourite place, you're probably dead. Um, but most of the places, this um, by coincidence is why I suggested here, um, but that's one of them. Um, some of them I suppose are internalised, so uh, Pellegrini's, um, still best coffee in Melbourne. Uh, this is not a Pellegrini's coffee. This is pretty good too, made by my mate Frank downstairs. Very nice. Um, but um, it, again, it's the favourite places, places are places where there's been some personal connection, not necessarily, certainly not necessarily ones I've been involved in creating, but um, Fed Square I think is a very good place. I think that transformed the nature of Melbourne. Um, not everybody likes Fed Square and I know where some of the problems are, um, but it's so much better than um, 
um, what used to be called City Square, which is not a city square at all. Um, South Bank overall, I think, has come up well. Um, some parts of Docklands, I've got to be careful what I say there, careful in the sense that I was responsible for getting that off the ground. Sorry, not by myself, but as, as part of the team. Um, and there's still a fair bit of, to go in, in Docklands. Some areas work better than others. Um, so there's some of them, but also some of places probably from my childhood. Um, I was uh, grew up born in the country, but grew up in, in Melbourne. Um, some of the little arcades um, in Swanson Street. Ironically, as a 10 or 11 year old, I used to go, and I think they were called hour shows, and where you paid uh, um, a shilling or something, and you went and watched four cartoons and a newsreel. Um, most of those hour shows now are strip clubs of some sort. <laughs> but as a 10 year old, that was part of my city experience, um, pre television, of course. Um, so um, those sorts of internal, external spaces which I uh, mix together. But uh, having been, while well, I've travelled a lot, um, having spent a large quantity of my life in and around Melbourne, then you, I just, to a degree, I take it for granted, I suppose. Um, it's only when I'm other places, um, and Brisbane's one of those, because I've spent a fair bit of time in Brisbane over the late 80s, early 90s. Um, there's some good places there too. Um, you, you've talked about your favourite urban places. Can you, can you think of some generic qualities that they might share? or Partly that you, um, stuff you don't think about in Melbourne, that, you, um, that I feel safe uh, and comfortable, um, that a place where I'm likely to meet one or two people I know, um, not every day, but often, um, a place which is aesthetically um, interesting and well designed and cared for, and this is certainly one of those places over 30 years um, that's been, been going on. Um, but then you start to think of more gritty places as well, and if where um, you know there are bits and pieces around some of the laneways, um, they're not particularly well cared for, but they have a bit of um, a bit of edge about them. Um, it's not an edge, you know, I mean, I don't walk somewhere if I think someone's going to clunk me on the head. Um, but I'm sometimes a bit out of my comfort zone, and that's, that's okay too, that's part of, the, part of the city experience. Do you have a, a view on the difference, is there a difference between urban design and placemaking? Well, early on setting up um, Urban Design Forum, a couple of trips overseas, I came back determined to get rid of the name Urban Design. Because firstly, urban, often it was to do with towns, not just cities, and that used to upset some people. And the other was design is a word which freaks a lot of people out. Um, because it's, you know, arty-farty, everybody thinks that you've got to be somehow special or wear a bow tie or do, do something. Um, but I've, a little reluctantly, sort of stuck with the term urban design. Um, placemaking is a term I use, um, but also place management. Those two things need to go together. Um, so I suppose I see urban design as um, in a very dynamic fashion. Um, it's certainly how a place functions, not just how it looks. So there's a pretty fair crossover, I suppose. Um, in many ways, I can remember being reprimanded by a, a, a fairly famous architect in Melbourne, who's now died, criticising using the term urban design because he said that they had the term civic design from back in the 40s and the 50s. And he thought that we had sort of got, uh, got a bit up ourselves using this fancy new term urban design. Now, this is, you know, in, in the 80s. It, um, and to a degree, placemaking is a, a, a little like that, I suppose, as well. But essentially, it's to do, I think, with um, places and how people use them. So to that degree, um, they are probably fairly interchangeable, I think, as, as names. Can you talk? Big difference between planning and urban design. So, what is the difference? Well, you see, uh, um, my background in planning has never really been in the development control area. Hey, I can do that, and yes, I've done it. But to me, that's not really planning. That's a, that's the tool to um, help places develop or not develop, as the case may be. Um, and planning is, uh, I don't think, takes into account 
uh, yep. the uh, neither the aesthetics or the functioning all that well. It's pretty good at drawing plans, um, but that's often a very shorthanded explanation of how cities work. Um, so I think there is a big difference between planning and, and urban design. Do you think has the has the planning pr profession moved away from design in the last sort of 10 or 20 years do you think? I think it's interesting to see where the, the current planning profession has, has come from. You're a different generation to mine but you see I came from an architectural background and planning was either architectural or um, maybe engineering or more likely surveying. But by the time I started um, teaching, part-time teaching, um, then uh, the emphasis was more on geography and sense of place, sorry, sense of place is the wrong term, but rather uh, spatial planning. And I think that was a big step forward. It's like a uh, land analysis sort of. Yes, sort of but thing. just understanding the uh, um, activities in, in place, not just diagrams. Um, and then more recently, um, then it's moved to other things as well. Um, so that there's a broader, sorry, we're being watched by security again here and I'm trying to smile at that lady. <laughs> but um, but uh, um, the, the, there is a, a theoretical side to planning which is, I think, too far removed from how cities actually work. Um, and I think that's been a bit of, bit of a pity. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's, it's a wrong approach, it just means that it's not an adequate approach. And I think without some sense, certainly of spatial, real spatial planning, and the third dimension, and the design dimension, um, then um, planning um, is, is just not adequate for the, for the task. Malcolm Snow talked about the third dimension in, in yeah. the interview that we did with him, yeah. and, and there seems to be a renaissance in, in the UK of, of planners not being, um, not necessarily being designers, but being able to think in the third dimension and think about built form outcomes and, yeah. and implications. Yeah. And you get groups like CABE, which is a very strong uh, um, government initiative. In fact, I've just the latest Urban Design Forum. I don't normally write editorials, but I have actually done one basically saying it's time that we did something which will be different from CABE, but which has the same um, mandate, you know, to, to do something. Bill, tell us about the Urban Design Forum and, and your role over the years. Yeah, it's an interesting Urban Design Forum because it's, it's in a sense, an unlikely thing. It came out of um, two things. In 1986, I was travelling overseas and um, had a non-meeting with Francis Tibbles, who you would have that would know her. Francis died far too young, um, but through a mutual friend. Francis didn't actually turn up, but uh, this mutual friend and myself finished up having uh, um, a little too much red wine and too much pizza in Soho in London. And really, he was a very early mentor of mine when I lived in London. Um, a guy named John Evans, he's long since retired now, but um, we really were asking ourselves the question, what ever happened to the bright young lads and, and girls of the 60s who thought they were going to make cities better? Because I reckon they're gone backwards, keep in mind this was in mid 80s. And at the same trip, I met up with the Making Cities Livable people in Venice. Great location for a conference, Venice, though. Seem to have been in and out of Venice very regularly over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and it was really out of those two things of interest in um, firstly making a difference and secondly looking at the functioning and aesthetics of place. And out of that then came four or five people in Melbourne. Uh, my dear friend, now departed Jan Martin, myself, we were working at, at, with Loder and Bailey, uh, Rob Adams and Wendy Morris. Now we also had uh, a fellow, I think uh, it was Tony Cooper, who was a, a, I hope you wouldn't mind me saying, but a redneck real estate man. And he used to come along, but he was a reality check for us. And we started off by trying to have meetings, and then that didn't work. And I think it was Jan who said, instead of having meetings, why don't we just have lunch? And so since 86, um, the second Tuesday of every month, Urban Design Forum has met in Melbourne, um, with the exception of January, um, and that's really been the nurturing and the stimulus for then the publication. Um, the Australia, um, Australia Council, was it called in those days? 
the federal government managed to flick us, I think it was $3,000 for the first couple of editions. A bit unheard of, because we weren't a, 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 an organised body or anything, but they thought it was a good idea. And it's really just gone on from, from there. But the rules are very simple, and that is 500 words, two good pictures, um, and something of interest to the urban design sphere. And that's really gone now. We're up to, I've just published edition 89. Now, I get all the, the credit, but Bruce Eckberg is the guy who be, is behind it all, and he keeps it organised, and, and his office is, is the base for it. But it operates on an absolute shoestring, um, and it works very much on the principle of delegation, although I never use that term. So, Brisbane want to do something? Guess what? Do I approve it? No, I don't. I don't need to approve that. Um, uh, do I fund it? No, I don't fund it because we don't have, we have very many funds at all. Um, and so it's really that nurturing, encouraging organisation and a forum. So if people have got something interesting to say, um, as long as I'm not going to get sued by publishing it, um, then that's how it gets up. And as I say, we're up to edition 89 now, and that's gone on since the, uh, since the mid 80s. Um, is there a membership? Not really. I think in a statutory sense, we're obliged to have 10 members. I presume I'm one. Um, I don't know who the others are, and it sort of is a little academic. Um, but we comply with the requirements for, you know, we're an incorporated body now. Um, and as I say, it's sort of an unlikely, um, it's not an organisation, it really is a network. And um, that's how I think I first met, met you two and people like yours and, and, um, and people across the country, but also around the world now too. Um, there's, uh, the bulk distribution is through the Planning Institute um, and the Landscape Institute, um, but there's all sorts of universities and other bodies around the world who get copies too. Um, New Zealand certainly has the case. New Zealand's an interesting situation. I had a, a phone call, and this all sounds a little bit morbid, but from a, a fellow who became a good friend, who, um, Barry Ray, who died fairly recently, very sadly. Um, but he rang me out of the blue and simply said, um, I understand you know something about urban design forums, what about coming to talk to us? So I went to, um, to Auckland on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, 20 people turned up, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. And then the same applied in Christchurch, and New Zealand really took off and developed their protocol. Um, they jumped way ahead, much faster than, than Australia. And then you guys in Brisbane with Udo and whatever, um, that really uh, helped at least. Uh, you know, a big leap forward there too. 2010 marks the 10th anniversary. Yes, I realise you know. that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Now that's sort of, I sort of think that can't be right, but of course it, it is. Yeah. Um, and so it's um, my role, I suppose, um, and I'm involved in a number of other spheres too, through my local community, is often getting things off the ground and then to a large degree stepping back and let everybody else do the hard work. <laughs> And accept invitations to parties and things like that when they, when they want to celebrate their five or ten years or do whatever. Melbourne's become the real poster pin-up of, of urban reju rejuvenation in Australia. What, yeah. What's been the key to the success, do you think? A couple of things. Um, I would suggest that Melbourne has often been a leader in ideas and um, in the broad sense, um, cultural things. Um, that doesn't mean it's the best or that they are the only ones doing it, but often, uh, so for example, in the mid, um, early 80s, I was involved in a thing called the State Urban Arts Unit, which was getting together the Ministry for Planning and the Ministry for the Arts. And out of that came a very strong tradition of artists being involved, not to do plop art, bits of art, but rather to think about how cities work and the artistic dimension as well as pieces of, of art. Coincidentally, um, Rob Adams arrived, I think, in 82, um, and his longevity at Melbourne City has been instrumental in changing the inner city uh, and, to a degree, setting a pattern for all sorts of other things as, as well. Um, and that's where perhaps Melbourne is best known in the design area. But there's also been a strong architectural profession as well, in terms of um, architectural leadership. Um, again, it doesn't mean that good stuff is not done elsewhere, but that's, and there's been 
uh, at least token, if not better than token, support at a government level as well. So governments have been prepared to, well, they've recently uh, set up the uh, uh, government architects office, um, but before that also employing architects to do government projects and that sort of thing. So there was a design interest there. Walking around Melbourne today, things are obviously going pretty well. Are there any challenges ahead for Melbourne, do you think? Well, I think one of the things I'm working on at the moment um, is to look at the so-called CADs, the Central Activity Districts, which are the out of the central area. Uh, you know, Melbourne is four and a half million people. Um, it's a long time since it was um, effectively a single centre city, but we've been a bit slow to realise that. So part of the challenge at the moment is the same sorts of issues, but applying um, to, I'm just trying to think of some of the Brisbane centres, but you know, the Parramatta's of the world. Yep. In our case, Dandenong is probably the... Mount one of and yeah. Chermsides and yeah. Intrapillis. Yeah, those. Um, of where, well, Chermside, I think, was one of the very early um, standalone shopping centres yep. in the 60s, 70s, can't remember that. Yep. Uh, in the same way as Chadston was the first step out of the central city. Um, and the challenge there is to get, well, as I see it, to use urban design in its broadest sense to deal with increased intensity of development and mixed uses and um, just and also, uh, for want of a better term, pure design itself, you know, getting the pavements right and the landscaping and, and um, signage and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that as the, really the, the challenge. Melbourne city central area is pretty much looked after now by, um, well, as I say, Rob Adams, Rob Adams uh, um, longevity and people like Jan Gell, who's been here before him, um, a guy named Rolf Monheim, who was the first one who looked at Swanson Street being a pedestrian area. That was back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s or something like that. So there's been that 20 or 30 year period. Um, and it's not as if it suddenly just happened in the last two or three years. Yep. You've had a pretty successful international and local career. Have you got any suggestions for young urban designers? Um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, internationally, I'm not known at all. <laughs> and locally, there are some people who prefer not to know me. Um, but um, uh, listen and look um, is the start point. Um, talk with people about how they use places and observe, um, not just talk with them about that. Um, get a base qualification. I think that's quite important. But um, don't look down on those who haven't got a basic qualification who may be involved in either art or philosophy or um, engineering Man or management or management uh, or any of those things. So again, it's that ability to um, work with a whole range of people. I mean, cities are made by a, an enormous cast of people, including the private sector. I don't think I've ever met a private sector person who said to me, Bill, I want to do a crack development. Um, having said that, I've, I've met, met and worked with many private sector people who do do crack developments, um, but that's not their intention. And therefore, the, the marketing side of ideas is crucial to convince people that they, and there's plenty of evidence now, that good design is good value. Um, and this space here, I think this is not a cheap space, it wasn't when it was built. Um, I am Pei, the American architect, was involved in this development early on. Uh, it confounded Melbourne because it put buildings at 45 degrees to the grid, highly controversial, and it had a big space there which Melbourne had never seen before, um, indoor, outdoor stuff. Um, so, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, it's, well, it's still here and been through two or three owners, but, uh, you know, it still makes money, I presume. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. The so, so, understanding development economics, I yes. suppose. But again, it's... An urban designer can't be all of those things, but the ability, as I say, to, to observe and to listen um, and to work with a whole pile of people who are coming from, from different directions. The, I saw on the internet that you're involved with the Priority Development Panel. Yes. The, Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the Priority Development Panel, the name's a little bit of a misnomer. It's an advisory uh, group for the Minister for Planning. Um, it is only advisory, uh, it doesn't make decisions, uh, it's not like the formal, I'm not sure what they're called in other states, but the, the tribunals which do make decisions. Um, 
And the main aim was really to, well, the one thing which attracted me to it was that it was inquisitorial rather than adversarial. Um, I've not been involved in the formal um, tribunal uh, system very much at all by choice. Um, the, the advocacy and the uh, adversarial approach um, I just don't find, um, for me, uh, not constructive at all. Uh, and it's interesting to be working now, the panel's been going, I think, four years, uh, of where uh, I think we've been quite successful in helping to bring parties together um, for a better outcome. Um, and one of my contributions is the better outcome in the urban design sense. Um, now, it's a group of about a dozen people from different disciplines. There's only two, maybe three, who are at an urban design event. Others are urban economists and all sorts of things, engineers. Um, but it's, uh, I think, been, uh, I think it's a very, uh, very good way to get advice to the minister, to the government, without going through the adversarial, uh, you know, 12 QCs in a room <laughs> approach to sorting out development, which often ends up in some pretty bad compromises anyway. There's certainly a lot to be said for high-level advice in sort of strategic areas. Uh, which, which is a bit flexible too, isn't it? It's sort of negotiable, it's, yeah, not, a, it's yeah. not necessarily a decision. It's more suggestions and recommendations. Yeah, and often it's just that third party. To a degree, it's, I suppose it's related really to, to mediation in the broad sense. Um, sometimes it's a bit like marriage guidance counselling. <laughs> um, where you've just got to say to a developer and a counsellor, guys, what's the problem here? You're really so close. Why has it taken three years and you're still arguing? And um, one or two occasions, uh, when I've asked that question, and I tend to ask fairly blunt questions of the parties, um, the response was, you're right, I'm not quite sure what we're arguing about here, so let's, let's get on with it. Um, the term priority, obviously, it's, I describe it as being in favour of development which is well thought through and uh, um, good development. Now, I know that's a, a value judgment, but it's not a question of development at any cost. And the word priority, I think, simply says, guys, we don't want to muck around for another five years. If it's a good project, let it roll. Um, if it's not, stop it now. Talking about opportunities for urban design in Australia, you mentioned an organisation similar to K but different. Any, any other great ideas that you have? Well, I think that... Um, that, that's the current one, I suppose, and I guess my um, my concern is that there's not been consistent government support. It's relied fairly heavily on individuals. Um, in some of my early, the same sort of time frame, actually, the mid 80s, early 80s, um, an architect, Evan Walker, was also the Minister for Planning, and David Yenkin, who interestingly, when someone asked him, how come you're head of the planning department, um, what are your qualifications? And he said, uh, I did philosophy, but having said that, um, I've never been qualified for any job that I've done. <laughs> and I thought that was an excellent response because obviously it was slightly tongue in cheek, but it basically said, you know, just because you build roads or something doesn't mean you're a good planner or a good urban designer. Um, and that was a kickoff. So that was a very interesting period in Melbourne. So with an architect who was the Minister for Planning, um, John Kane, who was the Premier and had been interested in planning um, since uh, probably the late 70s. Um, David Yenkin, uh, who, uh, who is still around the place, but he's now uh, retired, at least in a formal sense. Um, and at the same time, Rob Adams coming here. I mean, I wasn't to know that then when Rob first arrived. I had no idea who he was. Um, and then the State Urban Arts Unit, which started to get in, which I chaired, I was the so-called independent person and that simply meant that I could be beaten up by both the planning department and the arts, arts, and the arts uh, uh, ministry. Um, but that was the beginning of a lot of the interactions of a cross-discipline work. Um, and then out of that, a couple of years later, of course, came Urban Design Forum. So obviously that's my personal perspective, but I think there was a real foment there in those uh, early years of the, the 80s, um, stuff which is taken for granted. Yeah.
Um, and that's where thing, things kicked off. Oh, sorry, that wasn't particularly an answer to I can't get a to the focus of that question. I think we were, we were talking about um, the future for urban design, yeah. you know, and we've, you, you touched on a, a, a similar organisation to CAVE. Well, I beg your pardon, yes. Yeah. Now, to a degree, some of those initiatives was toe in the water. Uh, I mean, CAVE didn't exist in those days. Um, and the reason I use CAVE is because its heritage, it came out of something called the Fine Arts Commission, which is one of those um, fine old English, uh, um, you know, smoking jacket traditions. But then I think it was Lord Rogers, um, who has a very big ego, um, but also a big influence, was able to transform a very traditional organisation into something quite different. Um, and I think it needs that sort of jolt, if you like, to go into an next space. Um, but I think uh, it's interesting because we've now got state architects in, um, well, Philip is now in, in Queensland, Brisbane, yep. um, New South Wales, uh, Victoria, Tasmania, I think, have appointed, uh, and Western Australia. Um, South Australia have just set up, or in the process of setting up, something called the Integrated Design for Built Environment, of which the state architect is a subset. And I personally think that's the way to go. It's not just to do with architects. There's too much ego floating around, and I am an architect, but there's too much ego floating around individual professions. And what I'm interested in is the amalgam and the interaction, not just whether architects are the best designers or planners or urban designers or, or whatever. And that's why I think something like CAVE, um, there are a number, if you can read my article, you'll see the specifics that I think about there. Um, Australia is not England. And therefore, the form of government is different. Uh, I'm convinced that local government has to up the ante significantly. Um, you're in a bit of a unique situation in Brisbane because BCC is basically uh, you know, a state-sized organisation. The same doesn't apply to all of the councils around the place who most of them simply do not have an urban designer of any sort. Um, and therefore, we're going to do something about that. And part of that is the federal government taking an interest and the state government's taking an interest. The other is for 10 years under the Howard government, I don't, have, I don't have a party political affiliation, but I know good stuff when I see it, is for 10 years, um, the federal government really took no interest in cities whatsoever. Uh, and that was, was very sad. Um, so what you've got now is an interest, um, but an absolutely depleted public service uh, in, in Canberra. Um, Dorde uh, Eklund, who's the head of the major cities unit, um, I think has staff of three. Um, and uh, therefore, you're going to need something of the energy that went into CABE and the funding which went into CABE to the bottom line for many people is that cities generate enormous um, economy, um, both in the social capital sense and in the dollar capital sense. So, hey, time we refocused again on next to the mining industry, probably the, the biggest money earner that we've, uh, we've got in Australia. Um, so that's why you need that sort of um, organisation. And I'll be interested to see where it goes from here. Bill, thank you for being with us on Place Focus. Thank you for your time. Pleasure, pleasure, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was great, Bill, well done. I think that'll uh, 